Welcome back to our report on interspeech and today we are already on day three and yeah there are of course also exciting things happening today. There's a survey talk coming up, there's another keynote coming up and what else will we hear about today? So there are very interesting papers that I'm, um, I will be attending and I'm, I will really look forward to that. Also um, with the participants, I schedule some interviews. Oh, yeah, cool. yeah. So, so before the banquet or during the banquet week, we will be um, making some more videos that will be very exciting. So it seems that because we had this interview with Louis Timbosch in the first video, that quite a few people got excited and we were really able to convince them to also do interviews for these videos here. So let's see what we got for you. Okay, what did we see today? Well, there were really exciting things happening here. First of all, there was this wonderful keynote by Munya Eliyali, Adaptive Listening to Everyday Soundscapes. So she kind of describes how the processing in these soundscapes need to be dynamic. And obviously this is also related to the processing in the human brain. So actually this is also a dynamic process. And she very nicely points out the theoretical foundations of these processes and how these things can be implemented in attention-based models in AI algorithms. So I think that's a very, very good keynote that I can recommend everybody to have a look at. And then we had a survey talk. How did you like the survey talk? Uh, it was wonderful. So the survey talk was given by Professor Karen Levasco. Um, it was titled Learning Speech Models from Multimodal Data. So you liked it? Yes, it was, yeah, it was wonderful. So uh, I was very impressed with how she can talk about the signals in context. So we're not only talking about signals per se, but um, they happen in terms of visual context and movement context and also neural context. And modeling, um, um, this, this leads all um, to, to the multimodal approach. So, and, so she had this yeah. catchphrase that speech is multimodal. And yes. That yes. was a really nice summary. Yes. Of what she's so, doing. Yeah, and then using these all this information will really need to a better speech representation, whether it's for ASR or speech understanding, <clears throat> and maybe even for synthesis. And yes. Yeah, so what I really like about the talk is also it put everything very nice into context. But the other thing is also that she oh, went yes. through all these algorithms that are commonly used. So the uh, CCA algorithms and the deep CCA and how they have them building upon and how they were converted into deep learning models. So this is really a state-of-the-art talk that summarizes how to do representation learning in multimodal scenarios. So really nice how you can use autoencoders for this purpose and also other deep networks and putting this in relation with classical theory. So I really enjoyed that. Yes. So, yeah, and a bit I, of theory also. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think it um, totally relates to how human um, beings um, understand speech. And it has to be multimodal. And that's what we are, um, what the um, AI is headed, headed towards, I mm -hmm. think. So, <clears throat> these models then yeah. also explain things like the McGurk effect and so on. Oh, so, yes, that's, yes, that's yes, also yes, nice yes, to yes. link this to yes. the, the cognitive experience. So yes. A really, really good overview talk, and I can definitely recommend to have a look at it. Yes. And also, I, it was really um, helpful for um, our own ongoing projects in IBA department um, because we are really collecting these multimodal um, data mm -hmm. and that will be really uh, so this was really related to yeah, what we're doing. Absolutely I saw the presentation and I like instantaneously had two or three paper ideas maybe we can present them on next inter speech. <laughs> I really look forward to that. <laughs> Then there was also a really nice talk um, that was given by Ralf Schlüter and it's on the equivalence of segmental and neural transducer modeling and showing a proof of concept. So this paper is a really nice work because it shows the equivalence of 
some hidden Markov models, like direct hidden Markov models, and transducer models that are implemented in this encoder-decoder attention-like approach. And this is really cool work, so there's also theoretic evidence why this is the case, and this is then linked also to experimental results that show this equivalence. And yeah, really good work. And I think the Louis ten Bosch had more a comment than a question, and his comment was, we should have more papers like this on interspeech. <laughs> So you can have a look at the recording, it's really great. <laughs> yes, I really, I think this is a very highly recommended watch. And another paper that I really liked was the out of vocabulary word detection with attention and CTC alignments in an end-to-end -end ASR system. So this was given by Katerina Igorova. And this paper, I think I like particularly because so some colleagues have been working with out of vocabulary detection some years ago and it's a really hard task and I found it really interesting how you can embed it into an end-to-end -end model using attention and CTC alignment. So I think that's a really cool idea and if you're interested in auto vocabulary modeling then I would definitely recommend to have a look at that paper. Do you also have something? You, oh missing? yes, um, so I was uh, attending this Adresso challenge. Oh. Yes, so it's, um, yeah, it was um, basically, um, so there was a very interesting paper called Influence of the Interviewer on the Automatic Assessment of Alzheimer's Disease in the Context of um, Adresso Challenge, given by Paula Andrea Perez-Toro. And the finding was very interesting because not only with the Alzheimer's patient's speech, but also what was really um, um, in this research, they used the interviewer's speech in order to achieve this high classification. So accuracy. So this was uh, a very nice approach, so, so a the, novel idea, I think. So the, the acoustic cues are not just in the speech of the patient yeah, itself, that's the, yeah, that's but also in, in the, the interviewer's yes, speech. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wow, that's a cool finding. Yes. Yeah, cool paper. So if you're interested in that, have a look at um, Paula Andrea Peristoro's work. So I think that's a cool finding. So what else is, is coming up today? There will be the ISCA General Assembly. Oh, yes, yes. There will be a new president elected. Oh, yeah, that's, that was announced um, at the welcome um, ceremony. So I am looking forward to this. Too. Absolutely. And then we try to get some additional interviews of colleagues and maybe even at the banquet. Let's see. Yes. yes. You know, they, they have to sign off the, the copyright and that we are allowed to interview them, maybe after one or two glasses of wine, we can convince more people to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm quite impressed with the venue. Um, so, yeah, and you will be seeing that very soon. If everything works out at the hardware. Hi, Mohammed. Hello. So, how do you like the conference so far? Uh, it's very good. It's very yes. interesting mm -hmm. talks. Yes. yes. What um, was your favorite presentation yeah. so far? Uh, well, I liked uh, actually the last survey talk. Just it was oh, about, that was excellent. Uh, yeah, because it was about multimodalities, and I work with speech and EEG, so it's kind of yeah. related. Yeah, because I was for me, thinking it's, about uh, your, yeah, it's yeah. because it's uh, I also work with EEG, and here is the speech conference. It's a bit hard to find related uh, mm -hmm. research. So yes, the last uh, yes. survey talk was. Mm -hmm get some ideas. Yes, and then th there was the Q&A session with the neuroscience um, and, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and then yeah, this, this was really nice. Just yeah. in case, if you remember our day one video, we featured Mohammed's presentation already and so it's great to have you. Maybe you can quickly summarize your work on uh, EEG and speech. Yeah, so uh, what we want to know basically, the objective of what our study is to uh, to understand how the brain uh, processes the speech, like the natural speech. Uh, so uh, we use uh, electroencephalography signals. Uh, basically, we put electrode caps uh, on the head of the subjects and they listen to uh, some fairy tale stories in a silent room. And we try to basically decode the speech that they hear from the EEG. 
um, and it has applications mostly uh, as, a, as a tool for diagnostic tests if you want to know if, a, if a, let's say, a child uh, has a hearing problem or understanding problem, so this mm. is the direct application. It could also have other applications on the brain-computer interfaces, so you can read thoughts or something like that. So there are also research uh, trying to, well, in the simple uh, steps, trying to uh, uh, yeah, decode the thoughts. If you think about a word, can we get it out of EEG and stuff like this? And you can do that without the participants actively doing things, right? So they, they yeah, immediately yeah. process? Yeah, so, so the, the, the diagnostic test, the, the goal is like right now, if you do hearing tests, for example, a child has to cooperate with you and has to say, oh, I understand like 50% of the words. It's kind of subjective, but with EEG, you just put electrodes and you just listen, you don't need to do any other extra. So. It's cool, I think. Wow. You, you get a true objective yeah, measurement so yeah, 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 yeah. of speech intelligence. Yeah, yeah, non -invasive. Yeah, exactly, yeah, non invasive. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, uh, yeah, you mentioned yeah, uh, yeah. speech intelligibility. Yeah, that's the wow. main. Yes. Yeah. So after the um, talk today, um, the survey talk today, do you, did you um, have more ideas about how you, you could? Um, move forward with your research directions? Uh, well, mostly here, I so uh, I'm looking for uh, architectures in terms of the models to, to be used to, to do this, uh, like relating the speech to EEG, so I was thinking all the time, like uh, there was, for example, a CCA, mm -hmm. yes. uh, like deep CCA, exactly. uh, yep. uh, exactly. these, so to get ideas how where can I put the EEG and the speech, so I have two modalities. Mm -hmm. and, yep. What can I do with it? I was also thinking about like the current model that I used was based on an LSTM and yep. how it relate, mm -hmm. relates to the mm -hmm. uh, other models. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much yeah, for taking the time yeah, to talk to us. Thank you for this interview. Yeah. And <laughs> we useful. really enjoy your work and I'm very much looking forward to yeah, seeing yeah. the next developments. Yeah, yeah, the sure. next publications. Uh, yeah, hopefully. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you a lot. Thank you. Yeah, welcome everybody. So we are actually here on the Interspeech Banquet and we found some researchers to talk to. And I think it would be a very exciting opportunity to talk here at the Banquet about different research topics and Indeed. the discoveries here on the conference. Yes. So which, which uh, presentations did you like best so far here in Interspeech? So, um, I was particularly paying attention to a presentation related to atypical speech, mm -hmm. mostly different pathologies and related to different voice qualities. Mm -hmm. And so, well, A.D. Christiansen's talk? Uh, but if you ask me which one I particularly liked, it was actually Armin, which I remember and is going to stay with me for long because I was waiting for such a kind, such kind of a research. Like I generally deal with uh, uh, decoding or and decoding is not the proper word, but demystifying how articulators work mm -hmm. during spontaneous speech and what kind of dynamics play into. And uh, like, um, like I'll give you an example. Like earlier, like uh, the concept of nasalization of vowels mm -hmm. was understood as a binary problem. Like a vowel is either nasalized or non-nasalized. Mm -hmm. But when I did my research and I found out uh, that um, it's basically a very dynamic phenomenon. So vowel could be nasalized in between like mm -hmm. somewhere around the duration, mm -hmm. you know, a few glottal yes. cycles could be noise and nasalized and just can mm -hmm. uh, be just pure vowel, oral vowel. So, uh, you know, I, I was actually looking into these kind of uh, papers which can mm -hmm. implore more and yes, um, Amin's paper on ultrasound images and... Uh, so we already reported on this on our uh, yeah, day one yeah, video. Yeah, we re actually did, yes. Yeah. And so, a, a very, very interesting work and yes. uh, actually we also have Amin here, we will talk to him yes. shortly. And and, and 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 you were um, in Hyderabad. Um, Indeed. In, yes. And then, so I I am also interested. How do you feel um, um, the change? The, uh, the change. Well, uh, the change as in like from just, from the interspeech in Hyderabad and, and and today. Well, it's evolving. That's what interests yes, me the most. Yes. 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 So exactly. I'm seeing yeah, I'm yeah. seeing a lot of young people interested in speech domain and I'm seeing that a lot of um, a lot of people are um, 
more confident in doing uh, tackling problems which are non trivial mm-hmm. like uh, uh, earlier like we used to see a lot of tracks on uh, um, speech recognition speech synthesis and you know the usual speech related yeah. tracks but uh, recently we had a track on uh, covid challenge and we had track on Al- alzheimers and all so uh, it's quite interesting how speech is spreading its domain and uh, uh, a lot of people are taking up challenging tasks and they are it's quite interesting to see that uh, they are also using non trivial ways to solve it what do you feel about that um, the speech pathology and speech disorder research has just been promoted to area 13 on the interspeech classification system well i think it's uh, it's uh, it's quite encouraging to see that happen it's quite encouraging because uh, speech pathology in itself it uh, it's not only about pathology it's about deviating from normal and that deviation can happen for non pathological cases as well so it's quite encouraging to see that we are moving from the typical you know uh, uh, f- uh, 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 framework of speech to you know more like deviations and all so pathology uh, st- i i'm quite encouraged to see how it's evolving so it, it matches very well this interspeech is motto speech everywhere right yes indeed <laughs> and um, the thing is like uh, speech uh, in itself it's a very um, it's a very um, uh, what do you say like uh, it's a very prime source of communication absolutely and uh, it's quite uh, it's quite a characteristic way to expressions and communication so i'm glad to see that uh, uh, different kind of tracks are coming up which actually promote the uh, the essence of speech everywhere do you also want to tell us a little bit about the, about the research that you've been doing yes here? i'm interested okay <laughs> right so uh, i i actually work in analysis of speech primarily mm-hmm. and uh, there are two tracks which i would like to tell you about mm-hmm. uh, first is like primarily about analysis of speech where i study the the movement of different articulators mm-hmm. and their behavior for oh, different yes. kind of speech oh, wow. speech a typical speech mostly yeah. and uh, like uh, i w- i am here to present my paper about identification of formats which is in a very straightforward and low cost method which can be actually implemented on quite easily on hardware devices mm-hmm. so that is one thing another thing is like i'm, I'm currently uh, uh, broadening my domain into an uh, joint modeling of speech and other physiological signals so currently i'm working on modeling of speech and ecg together <laughs> to explore yeah. how how production of speech affects ecg signals heart activity and lung activity and other things so yeah that's those are the two things i'm here for well yep. so what do you think about the hybrid mode do you find it encouraging that we are essentially slowly returning from online conferences to offline or What's your feeling about that? See, conferences are about meeting people. Conferences are about <laughs> you know enjoying the uh, the discussions and meeting people and um, uh, you know moving around with them, you know, having all sorts of conversation, which is definitely not possible on a, a remote platform. But hybrid is a very good idea. At least from nothing to it gives something to people that they can actually interact uh, mm-hmm. in a certain way but i would like that uh, there should be more open sessions in the hybrid sense mm-hmm. so that uh, like we are mingling up around here for banquet similarly there should be open sessions for people who can come any time and you know reach out to anywhere uh, anyone and uh, maybe spend some time together but like mm-hmm. so i, I miss the poster sessions the the, the online format is uh, is quite different to a regular yeah. inter speech yeah they see some things cannot be replaced yeah. yes yeah. and i don't think there is any replacement to those poster sessions yes absolutely it's quite interesting yeah. to have a poster mm-hmm. on and you know, yeah. have a lot of people to you know yeah. uh, slowly they gain interest and they gather on your poster and that, that's a different kind of experience yes. so so um um and personally um i i am um i i am having a seminar next semester um with a neurological disorder and also the speech signals and so on. so so we are both um Alexandro and and myself we're both working with the times um series data okay. and yeah and then the, and, and i think um, it's, it's something really nice that um 
um, that I can um, read your paper and then you know, maybe I pre uh, yeah yeah we can talk about it more. Well, that would be fun for me. Yes, 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 and then yeah, yeah. I so, look forward to that. Absolutely, we recommend everybody to read your paper, and we'll put it also in the description of this video. And yeah. the next time we meet, we will yeah. look forward to the updates and the new research. And thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. And I wish you a great inter speech ahead. I mean, it's great to have you here. We already reported on your paper earlier because we really like this approach of the ultrasound and how you can generate the spectrograms from the actual ultrasound images. Also told that it's a super challenging problem. So for, for one person in one mount, it seems to work very well, but then as soon as you have multiple persons, it gets really, really difficult. Still, people like you are tackling this. So, how did you come up with this, and what are the, the aims where you're going to bring this to? Uh, it's actually flying the story. I realized that you can use this application, or how to say application, or translation, or producing a speech everywhere, like, especially in two places. One place when people cannot talk because of some difficulties on disabilities, and in some situation when people don't want to talk because of um, two opposite way. In one opposite one way, which there is very calm and quiet places like a library, when talking loudly is not very polite. So uh, people wanted to still talk. Maybe there is a, a call and it is very emergency. So. Uh, they can talk with their tonic cue movement or their bread signals, or even in the public places, in the conference, when a person is presenting something and you want to talk with someone, or a downside, or whatever. So, whenever, or in some other situation, when you want to translate um, a speech to text, text to a speech, uh, for people even cannot see, uh, so you can produce it to, uh, I don't know, their, their text from mobile to a speech, or people cannot talk their tonic cube movement to speech or for people cannot hear uh, to text so they can see <laughs> this is different translation on speech it's also amazing how the ultrasound technology has changed you know a couple of years ago these were these towers and they were very bulky material but today you have these handheld ultrasound devices that fit your smartphone and uh, you just have a Bluetooth connected ultrasound probe. So yep. this is really something that will be very soon deployable like everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and the most important thing is that even you can work on these articulatory signals by camera of your mobile by lip reading and translate it, but this is very challengeable. I wanted to go to this topic. I still I, I'm working on uh, ultrasound and fMRI, but this is the Next step, I'm going to work on it on lip reading to translate from lip movement to a speech. So mm -hmm. you can just have your camera, your mobile, and then translate it to a speech. <laughs> yeah. I guess there are quite a few people would be interested in doing this. Um, yes. Yes. So there's many interesting applications of that. Yeah. And I heard about that, what you said, because, you know, ultrasound is actually receiving the uh, punctuation hmm. of tonic cue movement that you check. So if you can put the laser on, from far distance here, maybe it is possible to, I don't know, translate it. Because I hear something, I still didn't went into it, but I just hear something by uh, by laser or by radars, then you can, uh, I don't know, receive this uh, tonic cue movement or hmm. this uh, punctuation translate to speech. This is also another topic. Is it challenging <laughs> modality. <Switch topic. laughs> yeah, it's very huge. And I know that a, a person which is working on this for healthcare in Canada, yeah, there are lots of professors. Okay. Same. What presentations did you like best on the conference? So that was I mean, there the were many very that good presentations. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay. Very good. So, your favorite presentation? Actually, um, I'm a person that do like much more applicable or use case of the mm, in real life. So, uh, I was wondering about ASR in air traffic. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> 
yeah, today. Yeah. This interesting morning. session. Yeah, yeah, it was very interesting. interesting. And I liked it. And I uh, found um, a girl which was working on it as a workshop yesterday. And today yeah, was a whole session about it. Yeah, it was interesting. It was a very challenging environment. Yes. So I guess you like the challenging environment. Exactly. <laughs> it's, the same that, it's the thing that I want to put myself into challenges that people think it is not solvable hmm. or hard to solve. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, thank you very much for You're this welcome. insight. And thank welcome. you very much for your time. You're welcome. And everybody, go ahead, read his paper and also have a look at the presentation. It's really a great one. So I can recommend that to everybody. Thank you so much. And it was a big pleasure for me to be here. Thank you so much for having me and for this interview. Absolutely. Yeah.